Okay, in this video, I want to focus on some of the basics of acidosis and alkalosis. If you want kind of a broader view, you might want to look at the YouTube on pH homeostasis because in that video I talk about how the body really needs to control acid levels because it can affect protein structure, potassium concentration, and calcium concentration. I also talk more about the causes of acidosis and alkalosis in that video. In this video, I just want to focus on how to differentiate metabolic versus respiratory acidosis. So we've got metabolic and respiratory acidosis. Those are the two different types of acidosis, two main types of acidosis. And of course, there's mixed, where there's a problem with both the respiratory and the metabolic system. By way of just a really brief review, the body does want to take pH very, very seriously. It has several methods to deal with pH or acid imbalances. And it needs to do that because there's acid produced all the time. And again, like I said before, we need to control that acid, buffer that acid, before it can destroy proteins, affect potassium, and affect calcium. The simplest and quickest one is the chemical buffer system, and we have three main chemical buffer systems. The phosphate, which works in urine and then also inside the cell. There's a protein buffer system, which means that proteins that take up H, they kind of spare other proteins. They also prevent that hydrogen ion from affecting potassium and calcium imbalances. The main chemical buffer system we're going to talk about in this video is right here, the carbonic acid bicarbonate system. And this is important because it's the chemical buffer system in the blood, where it's going to absorb a lot of the hydrogen that's created in metabolism that makes its way into the blood. But another key thing about this buffer system is it brings in the respiratory system because carbonic acid can divide into CO2 and water, and then the respiratory system can get rid of that CO2. This is also an important system when it comes to the kidney as well because the kidney can control these molecules to some extent too. When there's a lot of acid around, the kidneys can make sure they don't lose any bicarbonate and they can actually make bicarbonate while they're getting rid of hydrogen ion. If hydrogen ion is low, they'll get rid of bicarbonate, retain the hydrogen ion or the acid so that then you can get the pH back down to normal. So then this equation appears fairly important because bicarbonate here is off to the right. Carbonic acid is over here. So the H basically is the acid, the blue is the base. If there's an excess of acid, it can bind the extra bicarbonate, become carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is still an acid, but it's not a free hydrogen ion or a free proton that can disturb proteins, alter potassium and alter calcium. If there's excess OH or excess base, it's going to capture this hydrogen, become a water molecule. In response, carbonic acid, just by the law of mass action in chemistry, which suggests if there's less of something over here, it's going to split, or it's going to move in this direction, the carbonic acid will split into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate. So then we'll have additional hydrogen ion to bind to that extra OH. For the purpose of basic understanding what this means in terms of acidosis and alkalosis, we can focus on three main things. The amount of acid or hydrogen ion, the amount of CO2, and the amount of bicarbonates. In general, if there's an imbalance of carbon dioxide, this can cause respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. Acidosis if there's too much CO2, and alkalosis if there's too little CO2. Technically, any acidosis that's not respiratory is called metabolic, and much of the time, this can be caused by either too low of bicarbonate, which would cause acidosis. The reason I have an up arrow here is because I'm saying normally when there's a high H, there's a high CO2 and a high bicarbonate. So if there's not a high bicarbonate, if there's a low bicarbonate, this, is ca this causes acidosis. The same thing over here, if we have a low amount of acid, we should have a low amount of CO2 and a low amount of bicarbonate. But if we have too much bicarbonate, this is going to cause alkalosis or metabolic alkalosis. As a sidebar, I said that you can generally get respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis if there's a disturbance of CO2, and metabolic alkalosis and metabolic acidosis if there's a disturbance of bicarbonate. Technically, you can get metabolic alkalosis and metabolic acidosis without a disturbance of bicarbonate. This simply means that there's a disturbance of an acid other than CO2 and bicarbonate. It could be lactic acid or, or keto acids, for example. This results in something called an anion gap, which I didn't really draw up, but I'm really not going to go into in real detail, but I wanted to mention it because it's another method of getting metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Where it comes from is in the blood, the number of positively charged ions, or cations, has to balance with the number of negatively charged ions, or anions. Most of this balance is between sodium as the cation and bicarbonate and chloride as the anions. These values, these values of bicarbonate and chloride and sodium can be detected in blood tests, and in general, there's not much difference between the amount of sodium and the amount of bicarbonate and chloride. So the amount of sodium is equaled by the amount of bicarbonate and chloride so that we balance our charges. Now the body can't really unbalance those charges. It has to have the same amount of cations and anions. But you can get an unbalance in the anions that are tested if there's an anion in there in the blood that you're not actually testing for. So you're not testing for lactic acid. You're not testing for ketones. So if your test comes back and you've got a lot of sodium, very little bicarbonate and chloride, 
then you're missing an anion, and that's called an anion gap. And the missing anion is likely some sort of acid, like lactic acid or a ketone. And that's where the anion gap comes from. And the only reason I'm mentioning it is because you can break down metabolic acidosis and alkalosis further by looking at the anion gap. If there's not an anion gap, then there's too much or too little bicarbonate. If there is an anion gap, then there's something else causing the acid. It could be lactic acid or ketones or several other things. Okay, back to the chart. Now that I've covered that little caveat of anion gap, we can come back and really simplify again and point out that basically with acidosis, we've got too much acid, too much CO2, and we should have plenty of bicarbonate to balance that extra acid in CO2. Now given these situations, we expect some compensations by the respiratory system and then also by the kidneys. If there's higher CO2, we expect an increased breathing rate. If there's a higher bicarbonate, we expect increased absorption and creation of bicarbonate. So we expect more bicarbonate if we want to balance that extra CO2 and that extra acid. If there's a failure to compensate, that can tell us what the problem is. So if somebody is breathing slow, when they should be breathing fast because there's lots of CO2, that indicates somebody has respiratory acidosis. If bicarbonate is low, when we want it to be high because we have lots of acid around and we want that bicarbonate to balance that extra acid, if it is low, we have metabolic acidosis. On the side of alkalosis, we can do the same kind of run through. We have low acid, low CO2, and low bicarbonate is generally how we want things to remain balanced. In that case, we want to have a decreased breathing rate. That's one of our expected compensations because we want to get more CO2 in. That will get our H back up and bring us back into balance, get rid of that alkalosis. We would also expect to secrete and excrete bicarbonate from the kidney, so we would expect this level to go down. If we fail to compensate, then that's the cause of the alkalosis. So if breathing is rapid when it should be decreased, then this is respiratory alkalosis. If bicarbonate is high when we actually want it to be low, then that's metabolic alkalosis. I've kind of run through a chart down here that'll take you through the same thing. We've got pH here, and I put the pH scale just for reference. And generally on the pH scale, red is acidic and blue is basic, so that's why I've used the colors I've used. But if pH, if blood pH is below 7.35, this is acidosis. And if blood pH is above 7.45, this is alkalosis. And as I just stated above here, we can have some conditions with acidosis or expectations with acidosis that there be an increased CO2 or could be a decrease in bicarbonate. If it is the case that the person has too high of a CO2, then this is respiratory acidosis. The increase in acid is increasing the CO2. And if the respiratory system was compensating by breathing more rapidly, it would be able to get rid of that CO2 before it rose above around 45 millimeters of mercury. Since it hasn't compensated, since it hasn't gotten rid of that CO2, the problem is the respiratory system. So this is respiratory acidosis. If it is the case that the person has too low of bicarbonate, it means the metabolic system has not compensated, has not been able to get bicarbonate back up to over 20 millimoles per liter, and so this is metabolic acidosis. In the case of alkalosis, where pH is above 7.45, if it is the case that the respiratory system cannot get CO2 back up over 35 millimeters of mercury, it hasn't slowed down breathing to increase the amount of CO2, then the respiratory system is failing to compensate, so it's the problem we have respiratory alkalosis. If the metabolic system has not managed to get bicarbonate down in order to cope with this increase in alkalosis, down below 27 millimoles per liter, then this is metabolic alkalosis. We can also figure out the difference between respiratory and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis by simply asking the question, is the respiratory system doing what it's supposed to be doing given the levels of CO2 that accompany the change in acid? So if there's an increase in acid, we expect an increase in CO2. So in the case of acidosis, we expect high CO2. Thus, we would expect the patient to be breathing rapidly as the body tries to rid itself of the excess CO2. If the patient's breathing slowly during acidosis, this means the respiratory system is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, so it is the problem. This then would be respiratory acidosis. If the respiratory system is causing the person to breathe rapidly in acidosis, the respiratory system is acting correctly given the higher acid, which will increase the CO2. And the respiratory system is going to try and get rid of that CO2 by breathing faster. So in this case, the respiratory system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's coping with a problem coming from somewhere else. So this would be metabolic acidosis. In the case of alkalosis, we expect low CO2. Thus, we'd expect the patient to be breathing slowly as the body tries to retain CO2. If the patient is breathing rapidly during alkalosis, this means the respiratory system is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, so this then is respiratory alkalosis. If in alkalosis the patient is breathing slow, this means the respiratory system is doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's trying to retain CO2 to increase the amount of acid using the buffer system. And so the problem is coming from somewhere else, it must be metabolic alkalosis.